Hello and welcome to this exploring session and today we are looking at the Battle of Alcazar fought in Barbary between Spanish King of Portugal and Abdul Malik King of Morocco with the death of King Captain Stukely. Spoiler. Um, this is a play <laughs> printed, uh, I think the earliest printing is 1594, which is not desperately later than it was originally produced. Uh, dating on it varies, but very late 1588, maybe 1589-ish, probably by George Peel. Um, it comes in a relatively, what people think of is a relatively accurate in a sense, uh, a version of a performance script. Um, uh, it's relatively accurate apart from all the gaps. Uh, and just to forewarn everyone that every so often uh, you will see a, a dot 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 in, in the corner of, uh, of a line, uh, which basically indicates where we think a bit of the speech has been cut. And some of these cuts do render one or two long speeches slightly weird because they sort of jump between uh, points of uh, content. Um, but apart from that, it seems to be uh, very, very performancey based. Um, we have points of reference as well with uh, a plot that survives or mostly survives of this play, which is very much about the backstage action and some of the physical onstage effects. And I maybe uh, attempt to throw in some detail of that as we go along. Uh, it is an early modern uh, play. Uh, it is uh, therefore full of some unfortunate elements. Uh, it uses loaded language that we would probably uh, change in a modern performance. So be warned that there will be some uh, language like that coming up as we go. And there's also, shall we say, some unfortunate character choices that may also occur. Uh, we shall see uh, how bad or, or for that matter, uh, fine uh, these things are as we go to explore the text we have a crack team of readers for you today who are going to explore the battle um survey the scene uh, so today reading presenter hercules christo pharaoh spanish legate and demenices is hi uh, my name is simon nader and i'm a hertfordshire based actor writer and director uh, reading uh, the great selection of Queen, uh, Stukely himself and Z Zario is... I'm Steve Longstaff. I'm a scholar of early modern drama based in Lancaster in the UK. Reading the part of a Messenger, uh, Diego Lopez and King Sebastian is... I'm Alex Scott Belly. I'm an actor from the Highlands of Scotland. Uh, reading the part of Abdul Melek, uh, Attendant and Jonas is... Hello, I'm Helen Good and I'm a historian in Yorkshire. Uh, reading the part of uh, Muli Mahomet and the Spanish ambassador is... Hello, I'm Dan. I'm an actor based in Montpellier, France. Reading the part of Muli Mahomet's son and the second captain is... Hi there, I'm Victoria. I'm an actor and I'm based in London. And reading the part of Muli Mahomet Seth and first captain is... Aliki Chapel. I'm an actor, translator, and occasionally writer based also in Lancaster in the UK. And reading the parts of Rubin Arkis, uh, uh, another ambassador, not to be confused with the Spanish ambassador, and the other is... Hi, I'm Alan Scott, based in Suffolk, not an actor. Mm. Uh, and reading Abdul Reyes and uh, Calipolis is... Hi, I'm Tamara. I am an actor. I am usually based in London, currently in Germany, and very confused by these names. <laughs> and uh, finally reading uh, Cal Sipios Bassa and the Irish Bishop is... Hi, I'm Pamela. I'm an actor based in London, and I'm super excited to get to actually be Irish instead of just force people to be Irish. <laughs> yeah, you, you say that now. <laughs> and I'm Robert Crichton. I'm your host. I'll be reading stage directions uh, and uh, generally trying to uh, navigate some of the interesting textual issues that uh, this text throws up at us. But without further ado, and again, with the, just that trigger warning in place about loaded language, uh, we will enter Act One with the presenter. Honor. 
the spur that pricks the princely mind to follow rule and climb the stately chair with great desire inflames the pot in gar, an honourable and courageous king to undertake a dangerous dreadful war and aid with christian arms the barbarous moor the negro muli hamat that withholds the kingdom from his uncle abdelmelech whom proud Abdallah's wronged, and in his throne installs his cruel son that now usurps upon this prince, this brave barbarian lord, Moli Moloko. The passage to the crown by murder made. Abdallah dies and leaves this tyrant king, of whom we treat, sprung from the Arabian moor, black in his look and bloody in his deeds, and in his shirt stained with a cloud of gore presents himself with naked sword in hand, accompanied, as now you may behold, with devils coated in the shapes of men. And here we enter the first dumb show. So we have uh, Muli Mahomet and his son, and he's uh, got uh, two uh, young uh, brethren, the Moor, showeth them the bed, and then takes his leave of them, and they betake them to their rest. And then the presenter continuing. Like those that were by kind of murder mummed, sit down and see what heinous stratagems these damned wits contrive, and lo, alas, how like poor lambs prepared for sacrifice. This traitor king hails to their longest home, these tender lords, his younger brethren both. And the second dumb show. So here enter uh, Muli Mahomet the Moor and two murderers bringing in his uncle Abdu, um, uh, Abdullah Menen. Then they draw the curtains and smother the young princes in the bed, which done in sight of the uncle, they strangle him in his chair and then go forth. And the presenter continues. His brethren thus in fatal bed behearsed, his father's brother of too light belief, this negro puts to death by proud command. Say not these things are feigned, for true they are, and understand how eager to enjoy his father's crown, this unbelieving moor murdering his uncle and his brethren triumphs in his ambitious tyranny. Till Nemesis, High mistress of revenge, that with her scourge keeps all the world in awe, with thundering drums awakes the god of war, and calls the furies from Avernus crags to range and rage, and vengeance to inflict vengeance on this accursed moor for sin. And now, behold how Abdumelech comes. Uncle to this unhappy traitor king, armed with great aid that Amaranth has sent. Great Amaranth, great emperor of the east, for service done to Sultan Solomon, under whose colours he had served in field, flying the fury of this negro's father, that wronged his brethren to install his son. Sit you, and see this true and tragic war, a modern matter full of blood and ruth, where three bold kings, confounded in their height, fell to the earth, contending for a crown, and call this war the Battle of Alcazar. And enter the uh, close, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the pre-title sequence ends there. Um, so the, 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 the title Battle of Alcazar comes, fades up on the screen. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a really interesting uh, introduction that you have this narration while effectively um, what he's describing sort of intercedes and, 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 and happens. And we know from the plot there's quite a lot of detail additional here um, about, and, and this is quite an elaborate dumb show. Um, so uh, there, there is a, a sense of time and, uh, and space happening over this. Um, one thing I didn't note um, is that the presenter is, is, uh, is a Portugal um, is, uh, uh, as well. So he's, he's charactered, he's a not unbiased presenter. And I think that's quite important when we consider actually how loaded some of that dialogue actually is. Any thoughts about uh, that um, prologue, effectively? Hmm. It seems almost, seems almost as long as the uh, pre-title sequence in many modern films. <laughs> well, know, it's I mean, a lot of backstory. It's a lot of backstory. 
I, I'm just glad that you didn't tell me he was uh, Portuguese before, otherwise you might have got a really strange uh, Jose Mourinho sort of voice. But uh, thankfully, it's done. It's in the past. That won't happen. Just come back. Um, oh, damn. Well, I've started now. <laughs> so yes, it's 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 it's, a, it, it's that interesting mix of uh, you know a uh, traditional prologue <laughs> here as a plot, but also demonstrating the plot at the same time. Mm. Um, and you know these dis these events are not that far distant in the past. This is a history play, but you could almost call it modern history play because it's not it's not that distant. Uh, mm. These these events these are real things. Um, I think re reading it, you could almost hear a sort of underscoring, like a musical underscoring, which I which I assume if one was to do it today, you definitely do. But I'm sure you would have done then as well if you're having dumb shows like. Um, uh, tense stringing moments things like that it seems obviously it's got a rhythm because of course that's part of the art um but um i can yeah i can see that as being part of a spectacle mm. and then the magic happens <laughs> mm. uh, any additional thoughts at this stage before we move forward dan. You... Ah, sorry oh, i'll come, come to you aliki in a second dan um, just to note that the plot does actually say that there's a Senate, a sound of a Senate or a trumpet call mm -hmm. there at the beginning. Um, so unfortunately, no music cue, but doesn't mean that there wasn't. No, <laughs> but we do know that they at least hired a trumpeter to, uh, to, to make a loud noise. Mm. Wake up, you. It's starting. <laughs> uh, Aliki. You said it was recent history. How recent is it? Uh, well, the events in this is uh, well. We're building up to what fifteen seventy nine is okay. the the close of the pl the action in the play uh, with stuff therefore before that. Um, I think that's when the the close of the events is. So it's only you know the the actual battle that we're working towards is only about ten years old. Okay. I think, unless I'm wrong. Um, and, and the re the reference to Suleiman would be middle of the sixteenth century. Hmm. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> I don't know if there's any very slight cross-referencing with uh, what we were doing the other week, but um, uh, the, it's... it's well, with Amaranth. Mm. Yeah, anyway, we will move forward then. Um, so, act one, <laughs> scene one, we enter a proper scene. So there's sounds of drums and trumpets, and enter Abdul Malik with uh, Calisapius Spasa and his guard, and Zerio Amor with soldiers. All hail, our Jared Zario and E. Moors. Salute the frontiers of your native home. Cease rattling drums. And Abdel Melek here, throw up thy trembling hands to heaven's throne. Pay to God due thanks and thanks to him that strengthens thee with mighty gracious arms against the proud usurper of thy right, the royal seat and crown of Barbary. Great Amurath, great emperor of the East, the world bear witness how I do adore the sacred name of Amurath the Great. Cassapius Vasa, Vasa, Calsapius, to thee and to thy trusty band of men that carefully attend us in our camp, picked soldiers comparable to the guard of Myrmidons that kept Achilles' tent. Such thanks we give to thee and to them all, as may concern a poor distressed king in honour and in princely courtesy. Courteous and honourable Abdelmalek, we serve for pay, but as sure friends by our great master sent to gratify and to remunerate. Thy love and for his father's dangerous war, and to perform, in view of all the world, the true office of right and royalty, to see thee in thy kingly chair enthroned, to settle, and to seat thee in the same, to make thee emperor of this Barbary, are come the viceroys and sturdy genissaries of Amarath, son to Sultan Solomon. And here another Senate sounds. Enter Muli Mahomet Seth, uh, Rubin Arkis, uh, Abdul Reyes with others. Long live my lord, the sovereign of my heart, Lord Abdelmalek, whom the god of kings, the mighty Amorath, 
hath happy made, and long live Amara for this good deed. Our moors have seen the silver moons to wave in banners bravely spreading o'er the plain, and in these semicircles have descried all in a golden field, a star to rise, a glorious comet that begins to blaze, promising happy sorting to us all. Brave men at arms whom Amarath has sent to sow the lawful true succeeding seed in Barbary that bows and groans with all under a proud usurping tyrant's mace. Write thou the wrongs this rightful king hath borne. Distressed ladies and ye dames of Fez, sprung from the true Arabian Muli Zarif, the lodestar and the honour of our line. Now clear your watery eyes, wipe tears away, and cheerfully give welcome to these arms. Amorath hath sent scourges by his men to whip that traitor king from hence, and hath usurped from us and maimed you all. Soldiers, sith rightful quarrels, by heaven's aid, successful are, and men that manage them fight not in fear as traitors and their peers, that you may understand what arms we bear, what lawful arms against our brother's son, in sight of heaven, even of mine honour's worth, truly I will deliver and discourse the sum of all. Descended from the line of Mahomet, our grandson Mulik Zarif, with store of gold and treasure, le treasure leaves Arabia and strongly plants himself in Barbary. And of the Moors that now with us do wend, our grandsire Muli Zarif was the first. From him, well ye wot, Muli Mohammed Sek, who in his lifetime made a perfect law, confirmed with general voice of all his peers, that in his kingdom should successively his sons succeed. Abdallah was the first, eldest of four, Abdul M M Munen the second, and we the rest, my brother and myself. Abdallah reigned his time, but see the change. He labours to invest his son in all, to disannul the law our father made, and disinherit us, his brethren, and in his lifetime wrongfully proclaims his son for king that now contends with us. Therefore, I crave to reobtain my right that Muli Muhammad the traitor holds, traitor and bloody tyrant both at once that murdered his younger brethren both, but on this damned wretch, this traitor king, the God shall pour down showers of sharp revenge. And thus, a matter not to you unknown, I have delivered. Yet for no distrust of loyalty, my well-beloved friends, but that the occasion, fresh in memory of these encumbers, so may move your minds. As for the true, as for the lawful, true succeeding prince, ye neither think your lives nor honours dear, spent in a quarrel just and honourable. Such and no other we repute the cause, that forwardly for thee we undertake, thrice puissant and renown, renowned Abdelmelech, and for thine honour, safety and crown, our lives and honours frankly to expose to all the dangers that a war attends as freely and as resolutely all as any more whom thou commandest most. And why is Abdelmelech then so slow to chastise him with fury of the sword whose pride doth swell to sway beyond his reach? Follow this pride with fury of revenge. Of death, of blood, of reek and deep revenge, shall Reuben Archis frame her tragic songs in blood, in death, in murder and misdeed. This heaven's malice did begin and end. Now, at here, there is a suggestion that actually Reuben actually now sings a song. This is a late editorial uh, suggestion. We do not know whether he's just being <coughs> rhetorical um, or not. Anyway, dialogue continues. Reuben. 
these rites to Abdel Munan's ghost have pierced by this to Pluto's cave below. The bells of Pluto ring revenge amain. The furies and the fiends conspire with thee. War bids me draw my weapon for revenge of my deep wrongs and my dear brother's death. Sheath not your swords, you soldiers of Amarath. Sheath not your swords, you moors of Barbary. That fight in right of your anointed king, but follow to the gates of death and hell. Pale death and hell to entertain his soul. Follow, I say, to burning Phlegathon, this traitor tyrant and his companies. Heave up your swords against these stony holds, wherein these barbarous rebels are enclosed. Called for is Abdel Melech by the gods to sit upon the throne of Barbary. Muted, sorry. Basa, great thanks, the honour of the Turks. Forward, brave lords, unto this rightful war. How can this battle but successful be, where courage meeteth with a rightful cause? Go in good time, my best beloved lord, successful in thy work thou undertakes. And they all exit. <laughs> um, uh, war, uh, what is it good for? Absolutely. Well, actually, a play. Uh, so um, it's like any history play it, uh, where you have to sort of do some backstory and go into excessive detail about why we're about to do what we're about to do. I mean, it, the only real difference with this and most uh, English history plays is at least they're not talking about Edward III, um, <laughs> you know, for, for a very long speech. Um, but apart from that, it's very, very similar kind of stuff structurally. That's what it's doing. It's just not talking about English. Uh, but it's also interesting how it's it really seems to be laboring this point that this is somewhere else with other people and with, with mores and characters and, 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 and that it, there's a great deal of playing around with otherness that um, is, is, is going on throughout and the distinctions between various camps and, and things. Uh, any thoughts about that first scene? Well, I, I mean, you've mentioned Edward III. I must admit with the first sequence, I was thinking more Richard III. Yes, but that all comes down from Edward III. They have to explain Edward III to, to get down that far. <laughs> it's all Edward the III's tower. fault, grabbing children. <laughs> um, other thoughts about where we are? Everyone's silent. Nobody knows where they are yet. Okay. Well, we know where we are. We're just not entirely sure we're where we want to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or where, where, where the heck we're going. Yeah. Mm. Well, war. Yeah. And actually looking at it, Mully would actually make sense to pronounce Muller. Because mm. I think that's the derivation. Don't go there. Don't mm. go there. Well, mm. I would guess that the Xerif was Sharif as well. Oh. And it has been modernised so in other, yes. uh, other, other uh, things. Um, I quite like keeping the otherness sometimes of, uh, of, of earlier spellings. Um, I, I, I genuinely don't know if there is a song there. That seems quite a specious uh, suggestion to me. I don't know. Well, there's some sort of invocation. Hmm. Because she's, I mean, as usual, you've got the classical stuff in because nobody had the slightest idea what Islam was about. So you've got, Somehow she is she is making some sort of invocation at that point, mm. and the song would seem highly appropriate to what uh, is next said. Mm. Yeah, these rights to Abdel Mullen's ghost. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But maybe it's not a, a literal song, but more a rite of some description. That would be quite interesting. Um, a if... tipping of ashes or something. Mm. Mm. Okay, let's uh, let's go deeper into the narrative. Let's go into Act One, Scene Two. So uh, here we have uh, another Senate uh, being sounded again. Um, I see. Yes, uh, enter Molly Mahomet the Moor in his chariot. We have a chariot, people. Ooh. Wonder where that's been borrowed from. Attended uh, with his son, his wife Calipolis, and uh, Pisano, his captain, and uh, with his guard and treasure. Lots of treasure. Pisano, take a cornet of our horse, as many argolets and armed pikes, 
and with our carriage march away before by Cyrus and those plots of ground that to Moroccus lead the lower way. Our enemies keep, our, up, keep upon the mountaintops and have encamped themselves not far from Fess. Madam, gold is the glue, sinews and strength of war and we must see our treasure away go safe. Away. And exit Pisano with the treasure and probably some of the guard. Now, boy, what's the news? The news, my lord, is war, war and revenge. And if I shall declare the circumstance, tis thus. Reuben, our uncle's wife, that wrings her hands for Abdul Munin's death, accompanied with many dames of Fess in mourning weeds, near to Argier encountered Abdul Melek, that bends his force, puffed up with Amarath's aid, against your holds and castles of defence. The younger brother, Muli Mahmet Seth, greets the great Vasa, that king of Turks, sends to invade your right and royal realm, and basely beg revenge, arch rebels all, to be inflict upon our progeny. Why, boy, is Amarath's Vasa such a bug that he is marked to do this doughty deed? Then Vasa, lock the winds in word of brass. Thunder from heaven, damn wretched men to death. Bear all the offices of Saturn's sons. Be Pluto then in hell and bar the fiends. Take Neptune's force to thee and calm the seas and execute Jove's justice on the world. Convey Tamburlaine into the, our Africa here to chastise and to menace lawful kings. Tamburlaine, triumph not, for thou must die, as Philip did, Caesar and Caesar's peers. The Bassa grossly flattered to his face, and Amarath's praise advanced above the clouds. Upon the plain the soldiers being spread, and that brave guard of sturdy janitories that Amarath to Abdul Melek gave, and bade him boldly be with them as safe as if he slept within a walled town, who take them to their weapons threatening revenge, Bloody revenge, bloody revengeful war. Away! And let me hear no more of this. Why, boy, are we successors to the great Abdullahs descended from the Arab, Arab, Arabian Muli Shahri? And shall we be afraid of Basa and of bugs, raw head and bloody bone? Boy, seest here this scimitar by my side? Sith they begin to bath in blood. Blood be the theme whereon our time shall tread. Such slaughter, which my weapon shall I make, as through the stream and bloody channels deep. Our moors shall sail in ships and pinnaces from Tangier shore unto the gates of Thess. And of those slaughtered bodies shall thy son, a huge tower erect like Nimrod's frame, to threaten those unjust and partial gods that to Abdallah's lawful seed deny a long, a happy and triumphant reign. And sound an alarm within, enter a messenger. Fly, King of Fess, King of Moroccus, fly. Fly with thy friends, Emperor of Barbary. Oh, fly the sword and fury of the foe that rages as the ramping lioness in rescue of her younglings from the bear. Thy towns and holds by numbers basely yield. Thy land to Abdel Malek's rule resigns. Thy carriage and thy treasure taken is by Amurath's soldiers that have sworn thy death. Fly Amurath's power and Abdel Malek's threats, or thou and thine look here to breathe your last. Villain, what dreadful sound of death and flight is this, wherewith thou dost afflict our ears? But if there be no safety to abide the fortune, favour of fortune and success of war, away in haste! Roll on my chariot wheels restless till I be safely set in shade of some unhaunted place, some blasted grove of deadly hue, or dismal cypress tree, far from the light or comfort of the sun, there to curse heaven, and he that heaves me hence, to seek as envy at Cercropi's gate, and pine with thought and terror of mishaps. Away! Exit, and with that final away, and uh, for those uh, watching the video, uh, we've got a lot of sort of random one-liners or one uh, sort of alone, sitting alone uh, uh, on, um, and some people have placed them differently, but it, it does seem to be a thing that Peel does of, of uh, as to indicate a bit of a pause, you know, madam, away, tis thus. Um, uh, though it could be that it just wants to 
belong on the end of the previous line. Uh, the, the opinions differ. Uh, I prefer to use it as a, as a point of, of, of punctuation myself. Um, so we've got uh, a bit more plot going on. Some plot definitely occurring. Um, anyone like to pray see the plot so far? Not Helen, because she's, she's worked on the text. Yeah, I, I don't worry. I wasn't going to try. But basically, the question I'm asking is: anyone is everyone feeling firm as to what is actually going on? No, no. It's all. If I could describe it in one word, it would be at this point. Blah. There's there's a lot of stuff, and it's not really landing in my head as to oh. who who's who's doing what to who and who's still alive and what stuff is stuff that happened in the past as opposed to stuff that's happening. Yeah now um anyone I else to, not I, feeling that any any no. defense for the, uh, the 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 structure of things um, i mean i have a vague idea i i know what the two camps are that, mm. um and muli muhammad has just been told by his son that the other camp is much m better armed than he was expecting mm. right that's kind of about what i've got and i guess i know what the wailing women now were because they're described in the next scene in this mm. scene uh, it, anyone else sort of hoping the presenter is going to turn up any time now to sort of just just fill us all in uh, <laughs> uh, Alex I saw waving and then Dan uh, Alex uh, did you have something you wanted to say uh, no I was I was merely uh, agreeing with the fact I mean I find I have to say I don't particularly enjoy history plays I, I don't have a good grasp of British history so I really struggle with those and I usually spend the first half an hour working out who the hell is who particularly when there are people named with honorifics like when you watch a Chekhov and there's three different names for the same the same person so particularly this I think because as Helen said they've kind of thrown in everything to suggest how foreign it is because because no one really knows what Islam is it's like you have a reference to something from an obscure bit of the Old Testament and here have a bit of Greek mythology that there's definitely something other going on but I have no context that I could I could place this in so yeah beyond knowing that there's two camps I'm but pretty much at sea with it. Weirdly, the one who I really understood was the messenger, because kind of what he came in and said made some form of narrative sense to me. Um, you you um, want a clear-cut messenger, don't you? You really <laughs> want a, a messenger, you know, otherwise, yeah. you know, it's, uh, you don't want the messenger to turn up and do interpretive dance. No, uh, um, but in general, I struggle with history plays, so I'm not sure whether me struggling with this is the, the fact that, that it's just me, or whether it is just a bit obscure in terms of what it's talking about. Um, mm. At least if I was thrown in Edward III or Richard III, I'd know roughly where I was. Dan. I mean, I, I love history plays, but I still get confused by names. Mm -hmm. Dan. I feel like this is one where it really does benefit from its staging and by its costumes and its flags and um, which side of the stage they're coming in from. Um, mm. This is normally the part where near the end of the first act or much later on in the play, you're, thro you're thrust into a battle. Normally, at least the, some of the plays that we've seen, we've had a lot of, lot of exposition before we can even hope to have a moment like this. And so I kind of like just being thrust in and seeing, okay, how, thinking through, if I were to stage this, how are we going to do it so it's clear to the audience which are the two camps and what exactly are they fighting for. So I think a little less about them which name and which this and that, as long as you kind of, I guess, hit them the points of, we don't like such and such, and that's who such and such is, and that person doesn't like vice versa, um, rather than, you know, for us to take in everything and have a map that tells us, or some mm. sort of chronology or family tree. Yeah. Stephen. I wonder if it's something to do with the style of politics. It reminds me a bit of Gorbaduk. I don't know how many people were involved in that. Um, th there's, a, there's a kind of formality to these sort of courtly settings, it seems to me, that you don't find in some of the history plays set in, you know, sort of medieval um, Britain. Uh, I, I, wonder, and, uh, I wonder if it's something to do with the sort of visions of politics in, in these different settings and eras, which is very, very sort of patriarchal and hierarchical and inheritance is incredibly important and so on and so forth. So I wonder if the style of it is something to do with the way they vision, envision the politics of it. And that's why it's kind of grinding a little bit. It's, it's trying to give us a sort of vibe and, and a way of doing it, which, um, which we might not be used to 
but which if it, you know if if you buy the idea that it's sort of you know got some kind of kinship to Gorbachev, maybe this is a kind of sort of subgenre of 60s 70s 80s theater that we just haven't seen a lot of and, and find difficult to tune into it wouldn't be the first time we've had a reference to son of Gorbadoc. um <laughs> yeah i'm just Helen. wondering yeah, one of the things that I think you have to remember is that the English spent an awful lot of time congratulating themselves that they weren't having a civil war. Mm. Uh, because, I mean, if you look across at the French, they were deep into their wars of religion. And then you think of how it had been in the previous century when you're back to good old sons of Edward III. Um, the English were pretty keen on the fact on the, the the fact that they didn't have this sort of civil war. Mm. Alan, you were saying something. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering whether, in fact, we ought to have uh, done a bit of costuming beforehand and uh, had white and black hats, which at least would help with the identification of which side is active at which particular point. I don't know if that helped with game at chess and I don't know if it will help here. So <laughs> especially with some of the doubling, I think we'd, 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 we might, uh, we might get ourselves tied in knots. Uh, Dan, uh, and then Aliki. I do think, I wonder, I mean, obviously we, we have no idea how they marketed this play when they were actually staging it, but when it was um, printed, I had the whole battle of Alcazar, fought in Barbary, between Sebastian, King of Portugal, and Abdelhamek, King of Morocco, with the, deca the death of Captain Stukely. So I imagine that when they were handing out flyers or whatever it was, there was a clear sense, at least to the audience, of, okay, these are the two sides there. You can get yourselves ready for some sort of war play, mm. and, you know, to go along with the, um, the costuming and flags. And I think the audience does have an idea, at least I'm guessing they have an idea, of some, I mean, at least who the two cats are before walking yeah. in. The idea of pre-selling the idea of what you're, you're, you're selling so that you, you know, the audience comes with some sense of what they're getting. Uh, Aliki. I'm curious about the word bug here as used uh, about bus, bus, who is it? Um, um uh, amarath bashor such a bug um yeah shall we be afraid of bassas and of bugs uh it's i think it's uh, a more contraction of bugbear um right okay um so a thing a thing to be afraid of um uh, and also similarly the sudden appearance of the name tamburlaine here Oh, it's always good to throw in Tamerlane. yeah so if he just kind of a, an offstage horror he's as scary as the, the the thing playing in the other house down the road, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> or us or us the other day, um, <clears throat> which I think is much more plausible. Because they've got a chariot, so they're probably reusing literally <laughs> Tamblaine's chariot. But if if um Mully Mohammed, otherwise known as the Moor, is actually being played by Edward Allen, then mm. that's Tamblaine. Mm. Right. <laughs> So a little in joke there for the audience. Yeah, uh, it's not unknown for plays to sort of semi-reference to the parts that the other the actor has been previously playing. Tamara, are you uh, w w waving with intent? Uh, yeah, I was just I really wanted to hone in on the um, the ramping lioness um, because I just love the language uh, that's starting to emerge um, in this play. Because I still don't know what's going on, but there is amazing language, and especially the the ramping lioness and all of that is an image that I haven't come across in that sense. Mm. Uh, it's it's up on up on two feet, isn't it? Ramping, mm. as in rampant. Yeah. Like um, heraldry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, let, let's all do our best. Ra uh, ramping. To, no. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> That's thriller. That's though. thriller. That's thriller. Okay, so yeah, so that that that's it's a thriller moment, right? Okay, uh, so we're going to go into the act two, uh, which opens opens with the presenter. Uh, now the script doesn't have uh, descri any descriptions of the dumb show that is presumably happening, um, but the uh, the plot 
does. So I will at one point pause you, Simon, to fill mm -hmm. in some details of things that were happening while you were talking, or okay. almost certainly were. There's some sure. There. In a moment, uh, Nemesis will enter um, and stand by everyone to be ghosts. There's supposed to be three ghosts. I think we can all be ghosts. That'll be that'll be fun. That won't do terrible things to the software. Go for do you want me to pause for a, a ghostly woo, do you? Well, I'll, I'll cue everyone in. I'll cue everyone in for the, for the cry. Uh, so anyway, there's an alarum. Enter the uh, presenter. Who says? Now war begins his rage and ruthless reign. And Nemesis, with bloody whip in hand, thunders for vengeance on this Negro moor. Nor may the silence of the speechless night, dire architect of murders and misdeeds, of tragedies and tragic tyrannies, hide or contain the barbarous cruelty of this usurper to his progeny. And here enter three ghosts crying... Vindicta! Hark, lords, as in a hollow place afar, the dreadful dreadful shrieks and clamors that resound and sound revenge upon this traitor's soul traitor to kin and kind to gods and men now nemesis upon her doubling drum moved with this ghastly moan this sad complaint larums aloud into alecto's ears and with her thundering wakes whereas they lie in cave as dark as hell and beds of steel the furies just imps of dire revenge Revenge, cries Abdul Munin's grieved ghost, grieved ghost, and rouseth with the, with the terror of this noise, these nymphs of Erebus, reek and revenge, ring out the souls of this unhappy brethren, and now start up these torments of the world, waked with the thunder of Ramnasia's drum, and fearful echoes of these grieved ghosts. And at this point, at this point, just going to briefly pause you. So having been woken by the thunder of the drum, uh, the plot states, uh, to them lying behind the curtains, there are three furies, three furies, one with a whip, another with a bloody torch, and the third with a chopping knife. Continue, please. Uh, Magira with her whip and snaky hair, Trisiphone with her fatal murdering iron. These three conspire, these three complain and moan. Thus, Muli Muhammad is a council held to wreak the wrongs and murders thou hast done. By this, imagine was the barbarous Moor chased from his dignity and his diadem and lives forlorn among the mountain shrubs and makes his food the flesh of savage beasts. Amarath's soldiers have by this installed good Abdul Melek in his royal seat. The dames of Fes and ladies of the land, in honour of the son of Solomon, erect a statue made of beaten gold and sing to Amaranth songs of lasting praise, Muli Muhammad's fury overruled, his cruelty controlled and pride rebuked. Now at last, when sober thoughts renewed, care of his kingdom and desired crown, the aid that once was offered and refused by messengers, he furiously implores Sebastian's aid, brave king of Portugal. He, forward in all arms and chivalry, hearkens to his ambassadors and grants what they in letters and by words entreat. Now listen, lordings, now begins the game, Sebastian's tragedy in this tragic war. And exit of the presenter. And uh, uh, for Stephen uh, mentioning Gorbadoc earlier, this is remarkably similar in uh, theme to one of the dumb shows in Gorbadoc as well. So uh, the entrance of, of, of the visual nature of, uh, of some furies there is something that people can't resist. So we've had introduced by name uh, Sebastian, uh, brave king of Portugal, who um, remember this presenter is uh, of Portugal. Uh, so he's not impartial and uh he's he's again he continues to other left right and center there's some very unpleasant quality to this presenter's dialogue in places any thoughts no okay we'll move forward then to one uh alarums within and then enter abdul malik mali mohammed seth uh, um uh okay Cal Sepius Bashaw with moors and generosities and uh, and ladies and all sorts of people potentially. 
Now hath the sun displayed his golden beams, and dusky clouds dispersed the welkin clears, wherein the twenty-coloured rainbow shows, after this fight happy and fortunate, wherein our moors have lost the day, and victory adorned with fortune's plumes alights on Abdelmelech's glorious crest. Here find we time to breathe, and now begin to pay the, thy due and duties thou dost owe to heaven and earth, to gods and Amorath. <laughs> and thou draw near, and heaven and earth give ear, give ear and rec record heaven and earth with me. Ye lords of Barbary, hearken and attend, hark to the words I speak and vow I make to plant the true succession of the crown. Lo, lords, in our royal seat to succeed, our only brother. Here we do install, and by the name of Muli Muhammad Seth, entitle him true heir unto the crown. Ye gods of heaven, gratulate this deed, that men on earth may therewith stand content. Lo, Thus my due, due and duty done I pay to heaven and earth, to gods and Amorath. Renowned Basa, to remunerate thy worthiness and magnanimity, behold, the noblest ladies of the land bring present tokens of their gratitude. Stage direction. Oh, is this? I apologize. Uh, so, yes, potentially uh, some of the people who uh, uh, could have entered earlier or they could have entered at this point. It depends on editors. So uh, it may be that uh, Ruben Arches, uh, her son, uh, uh, Queen and Ladies, enter here. Ruben, that breathes but for revenge. Bassa, by this, commends herself to thee, resigns the token of her thankfulness. To Amarath, the god of earthly kings, doth Reuben give and sacrifice her son, not with sweet, sweet smoke of fire or sweet perfume, but with his father's sword. His mother's thanks doth Reuben give her son to Amarath. As Reuben gives her son, so we ourselves to Amarath give and fall before his face. Bassa, wear thou the gold of Barbary and glisser like the palace of the sun in honour of the deed that thou hast done. Well worthy of the aid of Amarath is Abdel Malek and these noble dames. Reuben, thy son I shall ere long bestow <coughs> where thou dost him bequeath in honour's fee on Amarath, mighty emperor of the east that shall receive the imp of royal race with cheerful looks and gleams of princely grace. This chosen guard of Ararath's janissaries, I leave to honour and attend on thee, King of Morocco, conqueror of thy foes, true King of Fez, Emperor of Barbary. Mali Morocco, La live and keep thy seat, in spite of fortune's spite or enemy's threats. Ride, Bassa, now, bold Bassa, homeward ride, as glorious as great Pompey in his pride. And thus ends that scene there. Um, anyone, uh, anyone want to pray see what just happened? No, but I've got a serious question. Mm. What, well, where did, why is Molly Moloko being bidden to live and keep his seat? Mm. He's on the other side. Mm. Oh. Mm. There, there, there are several little little things in this textually that I'm wondering about, um, but uh, that one I had not picked up on. Um, and I think a couple of lot. Oh no, no, no! Sorry, 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 sorry! It's absolutely right. It isn't Molly Moloko. It's because you've been so politically correct that you started calling the more Molly Moloko. So we think this is Molly Moloko, but it isn't. It's <laughs> Molly Moloko Seth. <laughs> who's a completely different person and on this side mm. and has just been made heir or king or whatever. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's right. It's right. Okay, good. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Alan, I see waving. 
Yes, uh, I think a couple of lines before that. Is it a typo, this chosen guard of Ararath's Janissaries? Should that be Amarath's? Uh, might be. Would yeah. make more sense. Yes, yes, got yes. That's just a typo. Random character. Yeah, yeah, no, that's just a typo. Thank you. It is um, noted. Did, did we also just have some child sacrifice? Or mm -hmm. do they actually go through with it? No, I don't. I don't think it was child okay. sacrifice. I think okay. basically they've um, apprenticed the kids to uh, the new governors. Okay, the bit about the father's sword confused me. I was like, are they? Yeah, I, I think he's got his father's sword in his hand and his mother's blessing on his forehead, and off he is sent. Okay, that's fine. Mm. Yeah, that's fine. It's, it's off, another off you one. Go and learn how to be beastly. Well, it's it's one of these uh, these things that this is a big public ceremony. Um, and, and, and therefore it's not quite coming, you know, they, they, Abdul Melek is making this big speech. There are huge trumpets to play. Um, you know, this, this, this is all choreographed, uh, you know, by the characters in advance, um, or it seems to be. So, um, um, okay. Any, any additional, oh, uh, Vic, sorry. But she does say she's sacrificing her son to God. No. I, I, I thought that too, but I think if you take a look at it, what she's saying is, um, she's, hang on, let me find it. Um, Not with yeah. sweet smoke of fire. To Amarath, the food. god of earthly kings, doth Reuben give and sacrifice her son. Not with sweet smoke. Yeah, she's, she's just sending him off to be a squire, basically, I think. How is that giving him to God then, though? Because she's not giving him to the king. She's not. She's giving him to Amarath, the god of earthly kings. Amarath is the biggest king, big go big king, super king, oh. god king. I see. <laughs> He's becoming crazy. Trump's apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's 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 put aside. Let us put aside uh, these these of course uh, uh, these these various rival powers and their power struggles. Let's go to some some very different people with Act 2, Scene 2. Um, so uh, these are all, all new characters. Uh, we've never met them before. Let's see what's going on here. So Act 2, Scene 2. Enter Diego Lopez, governor of uh, Lisbon, the uh, Irish bishop, Stukely, Jonas, and Hercules. Welcome to Lisbon, valiant Catholics. Welcome, brave Englishmen, to Portugal, most reverent primate of the Irish church and noble Stukely, famous by, they na by thy name. Welcome, thrice welcome to Sebastian's town, and welcome, English captains, to you all. It joyeth us to see His Holiness's fleet cast anchor happily upon our coast. These welcomes, worthy governor of Lisbon, argue an honourable mind in thee, but treat of our misfortune therewithal. To Ireland, by Pope Gregory's command, were we all bound, and therefore thus embarked, to land our forces there at unawares, conquering the island for his holiness, and so restore it to the Roman faith. This was the cause of our expedition, and Ireland long ere this hath been subdued, had not foul weather brought us to this bay. Under correction, are ye not all Englishmen, and longs not Ireland to that kingdom, lords? Then may I speak my conscience in the cause, sans scandal to the Holy See of Rome. Unhonourable is this expedition, and misbeseeming you to meddle in. Lord Governor of Lisbon, understand, as we are Englishmen, so are we men, and I am Stukely, so resolved in all to follow rule, honour, and empery, not to be bent so strictly to the place wherein at first I blew the fire of life, but that I may at liberty make choice of all the continents that bounds the world. For why I make it not so great desert to be begot or born in any place, if that's a thing of pleasure and of ease that might have been performed elsewhere as well. Follow what your good pleasure will. Uh, good, Captain Stukely, be it far from me to take exceptions beyond my privilege. Yes, Captain, give me leave to speak. We must affect our country as our parents, and if at any time we alienate our love or industry from doing us honour, it must respect effects and touch the soul. 
matter of conscience and religion and not desire of rule or benefit. Well said, Bishop. Spoken like yourself, Reverend Lordly Bishop of St. Asses. The Bishop talks according to his coat and takes not measure of it by his mind. You see he hath made it lust large and wide because he may convert it as he list to any form may fit the fashion best. Captain, you do me wrong to descant thus upon my coat or double conscience, and cannot answer it in another place. It is but in jest, Lord Bishop, put it up, and all as friends deign to be entertained, as my ability here can make provision. Shortly shall I conduct you to the king, whose welcomes evermore to strangers are princely and honourable as his state becomes. Thanks, worthy governor. Come, Bishop, come. Will you show fruits of quarrel and of wrath? Come. Let's in with my Lord of Lisbon here, and put all conscience into one carouse, letting it out again as we may live. And they exit, leaving Stukely behind. <laughs> <laughs> there shall no action pass, my hand, or sword that cannot make a step to gain a crown. No word shall pass the office of my tongue that sounds not of affection to a crown. No thought of being in my lordly breast that works not every way to win a crown. Deeds, words, and thoughts shall all be as a king's. My chiefest company shall be with kings. My deserts shall counterpoise a king's. Why should, I, why should not I then look to be a king? I am the Marquis now of Ireland made, and will be shortly king of Ireland. King of a molehill had I rather be than the richest subject of a monarchy. Hoth it, brave mind, never cease to aspire before thou reign'st, O king of thy desire. So, yes, we have some very, very, very lost seafarers um, who are <laughs> off on a mission somewhere, somewhere very different. Um, not, um, and uh, I think a fairly accurate depiction of um, elements of Stukely's character there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stukely, yes. Um, there's uh, various points where, um, uh, well braved, we have various bits where text seems to have been cut. So the bishops, one of bishops' speech, sort of just <coughs> halfway throughs and sort of is making a point and then stops and makes another point instead entirely. Um, so that there's little bits in that. Um, so yeah, fascinating, fascinating peoples. Uh, any little thoughts on this? I must uh, push you to be. Uh, quick, any thoughts you have? Wave at me. Uh, Stephen? Huffing it is a theatrical term, isn't it? The huffing part. So it, it's, a, it's a sort of slightly meta-theatrical meta reference. He's, he's going to be walking around in a certain kind of way. Mm. Simon? I uh, was just going to say, Strachey, obviously there's so much uh, setting the scene for what's to come, but uh, I really do feel it's at the expense of interest because I, I doubt I'm alone in every new character is almost like a, another stabby needle into uh, the, the synapses of understanding who, what and where. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I felt at least uh, with these characters, I had a fairly good good idea who they were um, and where they fit in the world. They're lost. Mm. Um, <laughs> Dan. Um, just to add to Stephen's point, I don't know if anybody saw on Twitter. I've seen I've actually seen this talk by Tiffany Stone when she talks about um, tragic walking. Um, it's the second part of her, um, a three part um, talk that she gave, but it was posted last night when she talks about the fact that Tamburlaine is known for stalking around about um, there's re several references um, to him in other plays of him stalking, and so I wonder if this hoofing thing is another um, avenue on which someone can chase up mm. uh, to see what types of characters who hoof around. Um, but the other thing is, is that um, the prologue, not the prologue, the presenter is doubled in the plot as um, as Diego Lopez there. So just for a casting note there, mm. it's Richard Allen. Who's cast as him? Excellent. Uh, okay, uh, we're going to move for, uh, rapidly on though. Uh, so uh, next scene, uh, two three. Enter uh, Muli Mohammed, the Moor with uh, Calipolis, his wife, his son, son, and two others. 
Where art thou, boy? Where is Calipolis? Oh, deadly wound that passeth by mine eye, the fatal poison of my swelling heart. Oh, fortune constant in inconstancy. Fight earthquakes in the entrails of the earth and eastern whirlwinds in the hellish shades. Some foul contagion of the infected heaven blast all the trees and in their cursed tops. The dismal night raven and the tragic owl breed and become foretellers of my fall. The fatal ruin of my name and me. Adders and serpents hiss at my disgrace and wound the earth with anguish of their stings. Now, Abdelamek, now triumphant fess, fortune hath made thee king of Barbary. Muted. Alas, my lord, would boot these huge explain, exclaims the advantage us in this distress at this state. O oh, pity our perplexed estate, my lord, and turn all curses to submiss complaints, and those complaints to action of relief. I feigned, my lord, and nought may cursing plaints refresh the fading substance of my life. Faint all the world, consume and be accursed, since my state faints and is accursed. Yet patience, lord, to conquer sorrow so. What patience is for him that lacks his crown? There is no patience where the loss is such. The shame of my disgrace hath put on wings and swiftly flies about this earthly ball. Carest thou to live then, fond Calipolis, when he that should give his essence to thy soul, he on whose glory all thy joy should stay, is soulless, gloryless, and desperate, crying for battle, famine, sword, and fire, rather than calling for relief or life. But be content, thy hunger shall have end. Famine shall pine to death, and thou shalt live. I will go hunt these cursed solitaries and make the sword and target here, um, here my hound to pull down lions and untamed beasts. And the exits. Tush, mother, cherish your unhearty soul and feed with hope of happiness and ease. For if by valor or by policy, my kingly father can be fortunate, we shall be Jove's commanders once again and flourish in a threefold happiness. His majesty, hath sent Sebastian, the good and harmless King of Portugal, a promise to resign the royalty and kingdom of Morocco to his hands. And when this haughty offer takes effect and works affiance in Sebastian, my gracious Lord warned wisely to advise, I doubt not but will watch occasion and take her foretop by the slenderest hair to rid us of this miserable life. Good madam, cheer yourself. My father's wise. He can submit himself and live below, make show of friendship, promise, vow, and swear, till by the virtue of his fair pretense, Sebastian trusting his integrity, he makes himself possessor of such fruits as grow upon such great advantages. But more dishonour hangs on such misdeeds than all the profit their return can bear. Such secret judgments have the heavens imposed upon the drooping state of Barbary, as public merits in such lewd attempts have drawn with violence upon our heads. And here enter, re-enter Muli Mahomet uh, with flesh upon his sword. Hold thee, Calipolis, feed and faint no more. This flesh I forced from a lioness, meat of a princess, for a princess meat, learned by her noble stomach to esteem penury plenty in extremest death, who with, when she saw her foragement breath, pine not in melancholy or childish fear, but as brave minds are strongest in extremes. So she, redoubling her former force, ranged through the woods and rent the breeding vaults of proudest savages to save herself. Feed them and faint not fair Calipolis, for rather than fierce famine shall prevail to gnaw thy entrails with her thorny teeth, the, conquerors, the conquering lioness shall attend on thee and lay huge heaps of slaughtered carcasses as bullocks in her way to keep her back. I will provide thee of a princely osprey that as she flieth over fish and pools, the fish shall turn their glistering bellies up 
and thou shalt take thy liberal choice of all. Jove's stately bird, with wide commanding wings, shall hover still about thy princely head, and beat down fowl by shoals into thy lap. Feed then, and faint not, fair Callipolis. Thanks, good my lord, and though my stomach be too queasy to digest such bloody meat, yet strength I it with virtue of my mind. I doubt no wit, but I shall live, my lord. Into the shades then, fair Callipolis, and make thy son and negroes here good cheer. Feed and be fat, and we may meet the foe with strength and terror to revenge our wrong. Yes, it's a traditional stage in uh, 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 threatened masculinity to uh, go out and kill a lion um, and, and present its raw meat uh, for uh, other, uh, other people. Um, interesting scene. Thoughts on this scene? Well, again, just, just asking the question, anyone want to pray see what actually just happened? I can guess. Uh, my dad is going to be all nicey-nicey to the King of Portugal and get him to come and help fight. I think. Yes, no. I, I, does the room agree? Yeah. I don't think he brought back flesh of a lion. I think he brought back the lion's prey. I, th that I would he agree. Had taken from the lioness. <clears throat> That's how I read it. Mm. Mm. There is actually a prop call in the plot that says raw flesh. Mm. No, yes, it's definitely raw. <laughs> yeah. And he hasn't noticed she's a vegetarian. <laughs> Did they believe them those days? Well, it, well, it's an interesting question, actually, how uh, Callipolis is sort of going, yeah, that's, um, thanks for that. That's lovely. Lovely. I'll just put it over here. Uh... <laughs> also, yeah, Dan. Also Last speech, um, 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 Willie Muhammad, it says that um, he was left manic there on the stage. So apparently she left and then he's left to say that final, final. Well, well there, there is a note here that, uh, as, you know, that it, 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 there may be missing speech at the end there that he had a much more lengthy soliloquy at the end. Because uh, it doesn't end on uh, 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 in, a, in a couplet or anything. So it doesn't necessarily feel like it's uh, perhaps the, the actual end of, of his speech there. Um, but it could be. There's no absolute rule on such things. Um, so, uh, yeah. Things are happening. Things are happening. Uh, let's go on to 2-4. Uh, I, 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 I feel like I'm losing the room here. Uh, so... <laughs> Definitely feeling that. Definitely feeling that. Okay. Uh, act two, scene four. I, let's wake you up. Uh, there's a sounding of a senate. Enter Sebastian, king of Portugal, the Duke of Aveiro, Duke of things. Uh, lots of people. Barcelona. Faro de Taverna and attendants and things. There's lots of people on stage. But we get to meet King Sebastian, who speaks first. Call forth those Moors, those men of Barbary, that came with letters from the king of Fes. And exit one, and the Moorish ambassadors are brought. Ye warlike lords and men of chivalry, honourable ambassadors of this high regent, hark to Sebastian, king of Portugal. These letters sent from your distressed lord, torn from his throne by Abdelmelech's hand, strengthened and raised by furious Amarath, import a kingly favour at our hands, for aid to reobtain his royal seat and place his fortunes in their former height. Acquittal of which honourable arms, by these his letters, he doth firmly vow wholly to yield and to surrender up the kingdom of Moroccus to our hands, and to become to us contributory, and to content himself with the realm of Fez. These lines, my lords, writ in extremity, contain therefore that during fortune's date, how shall Sebastian then believe the same? Viceroys, a most Christian king of Portugal, to satisfy thy doubtful mind herein, command forthwith a blazing brand of fire be brought in presence of thy majesty. Then shalt thou see, by our religious vows and ceremonies most inviolate, how firm our sovereign's protestations are. And we can indicate, there's an indication, uh, there's no stage direction, but we can assume a brand is brought in here by an attendant. Behold, my lord, this binds our faith to thee. 
in token that great Muli Muhammad's hand hath writ no more than his stout heart allows, and will perform to thee and to thine heirs, we offer here our hands into this flame, and as this flame doth fasten on this flesh, so from our souls we wish it may consume the heart of our great Lord and Sovereign, Muli Muhammad, King of Barbary, if his intent agree not with his words. These ceremonies and protestations sufficeth us, ye lords of Barbary. Therefore return this answer to your king. Assure him by the honour of my crown, and by Sebastian's true unfeigned faith, he shall have aid and succour to recover, and seat him in his former empery. Let him rely upon our princely word. Tell him by August we will come to him, with such a power of brave, impatient minds as Abdel Malek and great Amorath shall tremble at the strength of Portugal. Thanks to the renowned king of Portugal, on whose stout promises our state depends. Barbarians, go, glad your distressed king, and say Sebastian lives to right his wrong. And exit the, uh, the, the quite hardcore ambassadors, it has to be said there. Duke of Avero. Call in those Englishmen, Don Stukely, and those captains of the fleet that lately landed in our Bay of Lisbon. Now breathe, Sebastian, and in breathing blow some gentle gale of thy new former joys. Duke of Avero, it shall be your charge to take the muster of the Portugals and bravest bloods of all our country. And we can assume here that uh, Duke of Avero leaves. Luis de Silva. You shall be dispatched with letters unto Philip, King of Spain. Tell him we crave his aid in this behalf. I know our brother Philip nil deny his furtherance in this holy Christian war. Duke of Barcelos, as thy ancestors have always loyal been to Portugal, so now, in honour of thy toward youth, thy charge shall be to Antwerp speedily, to hire us mercenary men-at-arms. Promise them princely pay, and be thou sure, thy word is ours. Sebastian speaks the word. I beseech your majesty, employ me in this war. Christopher de Tavera, next unto myself, my good Hephaestion and my bedfellow, thy cares and mine shall be alike in this, and thou and I will live and die together. Da, 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 da. Yes, uh, Stukely gets, uh, uh, gets a senate. Um, so uh, enter Stukely with the Irish bishop, Jonas Hercules, and possibly also with the Duke of Herrera returning. And now, brave Englishmen, to you I turn, whom angry storms have put into our bay. Hold not your fortune ever the worse in this. We hold our strangers' honours in our hand, and for distressed frank and free relief, tell me then, Stukely, for that's thy name, I trow, wilt thou, in honour of thy country's fame, hazard thy person in this brave exploit, and follow us to fruitful Barbary with these six thousand soldiers thou hast brought? and choicely picked through wanton Italy. Thou art a man of gallant personage, proud in thy looks and famous every way. Frankly, tell me, wilt thou go with me? Courageous king, the wonder of my thoughts, and yet, my lord, with pardon, understand, myself and these whom weather hath enforced to lie road upon thy gracious coast, did bend our course and make a main for Ireland. For Ireland, Stukely, thou mistakest wondrous much. Uh, with seven ships, two pinnaces, and six thousand men? I tell thee, Stukely, they are far too weak to violate the Queen of Ireland's right. For Ireland's Queen commandeth England's force, where, where every ship ten thousand on the seas, manned with the strength of all the eastern kings, conveying all the monarchs of the world to invade the island where her highness reigns, to all in vain. For heavens and destinies attend and wait upon her majesty. Sacred, imperial, and holy is her seat, shining with wisdom, love, and mightiness, nature that everything imperfect made, fortune that never yet was constant found, time that defaceth every golden show, dare not decay, remove, or her impair. Both nature, time, and fortune agree to bless and serve her royal majesty. The wallowing ocean hems her round about, whose raging floods do swallow up her foes. And on the rocks their ships in pieces split, and even in Spain, where all the traitors dance and play themselves upon a sunny day, securely guard the west part of her isle. The south the narrow Britain sea begirts, where Neptune sits in triumph to direct their course to hell that aim at her disgrace. 
The German seas alongst the east do run, where Venus banquets all her water nymphs, that with her beauty glancing on the waves disdains the cheek of fair Proserpina. Advise I'll just you. pause you there. The, 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 <laughs> this has been a party political <laughs> broadcast on behalf <laughs> of Privy Council. Now a message from our sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, it's just, it's oh. just nauseating, isn't, isn't it? it? It's just, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, how is a reliable guide to what's going on in our <laughs> yeah. oh. I don't think. God, no. <laughs> um, uh, very well oh. done, by the way. Uh, a couple of you um, do not have marked in uh, some of the uh, presumed cuts, so Stukely going, Courageous King, the wonder of my thoughts. And yet, my lord. Yeah. Um, there's, there's something missing there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and also, just King Sebastian, you sort of uh, jump halfway through yours as well. But uh, well, well navigated, well navigated. You haven't finished yet, of course. You've still got more. <laughs> but thankfully, oh, good. back on point. Back to the plot. Back on point. Um, <laughs> so, uh, King Sebastian, do continue. Eh? <laughs> Advise thee, then, proud Stukely, ere thou pass to wrong the wonder of the highest god. Sith danger, death, and hell do follow thee, thee and them all that seek to danger her. If honour be the mark whereat thou aimst, then follow me in holy Christian wars, and leave to seek thy country's overthrow. Rather, my lord, let me admire these words than answer to your firm objections. His holiness, Pope Gregory the Seventh, hath made us for the leaders of the rest. Amongst the rest, my lord, I am but one. If they agree, Stukely will be the first to die with honour for Sebastian. Tell me, Lord Bishop, Captains, tell me all, are you content to leave this enterprise against your country and your countrymen to aid Mohammed, King of Barbary? To aid Mohammed, King of Barbary? Tis against our vows, great King of Portugal. Then, Captains, what say you? I say, my Lord, as the Bishop said, we may not turn from conquering Ireland. Our country and our countrymen will condemn us worthy of death if we neglect our vows. Consider, lords, you are now in Portugal, and I may now dispose of you and yours. Hath not the wind and weather given you up, and made you captives at our royal will? It hath, my lord, and willingly we yield to be commanded by your majesty. But if you make us voluntary men, our course is then direct for Ireland. That course will we direct for Barbary. Follow me, lords. Sebastian leads the way to plant the Christian faith in Africa. St. George for England, and Ireland now adieu. For here Tom Stukely shapes his course anew. I love that bit of negotiating. So, well, <laughs> technically, we, we must f uh, fulfill, as free people, we must do uh, as, our, as our vows have said. You're not free. Okay, we'll do whatever you like, my lord. Uh, <laughs> such sophistry. Um, it's a funny old scene, that. It's really quite interesting. Um, you know, because it is basically, you've, you've got this army, let's... Uh, I mean, Stukely doesn't care. I mean, clearly doesn't care where he's going to go off and fight and do things. Um, I, I, he wanted to be king of Ireland. Hmm. The fact that his chances of becoming King of Ireland with this very, very small Italian army mm. were remote. Mm. Albeit the slightly confused nature of uh, Jonas and Hercules' actual nationality. It's a, they're sort of English uh, Italians. It's very confused. Um, yeah. there's, there's kind of <laughs> irony about Crusades as well, isn't there? Mm. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, oh. <clears throat> St. George then. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the um, English mercenary who uh, sold his allegiance to just about everybody in Italy and much of Europe. Stukely. Um, no, there, there was. I mean, a, no, literally, Stukely bound. did. <laughs> yeah, but there was a landbound one as well. Mm. Um, well, no, he he fought on land too. It, he, I, I'm, I'm not joking. You might be thinking of Stukely. This man sold his allegiance left, right, and centre. Uh, and then pretended to sell it to the opposing side as well. Um, it, it's, it, he, his career is astounding in its um, uh, just, just complete lack of interest in, in anybody's uh, affairs but his own. Release the report! <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so he, you know, he's, uh, uh, yeah, his, 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 his career is fast, and I, I would love to talk more about it because it, it really is fascinating. But we got another play on Stukely where we can, we can dip into that d- detail more, more uh, honestly. Um, before we go into Act 3, any final thoughts about uh, the, these two acts or this scene, uh, where we are so far? We're two acts in, people. I have yes. to say, oh. uh, Helen first, then uh, Alex. I think that it's the two sides that are building up are in fact the Portuguese and Amorath. Because although Amorath doesn't appear so far, nevertheless, he is on one side and the Portuguese are on the other. And they're the big powers, if you see what I mean. And Morocco is just the place they're fighting it out. Mm. Yeah, so we're on the proxy war. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Alex. Yeah, I have to say, I, I, sort of following on from what Helen said, that's it, the the plot started to slightly crystallise there for me, despite that long party political broadcast diversion. I, I think because Sebastian is sort of one of the title characters, and because he's not in those first few scenes, it's weird. It's one of those plays that seems to to wheel on two of its main characters, its title characters, Sebastian and Stukely, quite late, late, relatively late on in the play. So actually all that fookling at the beginning sort of almost amounts to nothing. So long as you understand, like, like Helen said, it's Amaranth and, and Portugal going at one another, and this is some sort of religious war or whatever it is, that seems to be the crux of it. Um, it, it seems like one of those plays that introduces the sort of supporting cast before you then wheel on the big, big bad and the, Big good if there are such things in this play, but it, it sort of made slightly more sense. I don't know whether that's just because it's closer to home. Portugal and Ireland are a bit closer to, um, but yeah, it finally started to make some sort of sense to me. Mm. I'm going to have to push us forward, but Aliki, one one quick thought. Just very quickly, picking up the the Cold War thing. So Amarath in Istanbul on the one hand, and Sebastian in Portugal on the other working their way in in the civil war in morocco yeah mm. okay cool. uh okay uh i'm gonna pause you uh midway through your, your next presenter bit simon so after dies there on i'm gonna pause you just uh, so sure. you know because there's some additional information to throw at you so once again with the sounding of a senate <laughs> enter the presenter Lo, thus unto a lake of blood and gore, the brave, courageous king of Portugal hath drenched himself, and now prepares amain with sails and oars to cross the swelling seas with men and ships, courage and cannon shot, to plant this cursed moor in fatal hour. And in this Catholic case, the king of Spain is called upon by sweet Sebastian, who, surfeiting in prime time of his youth upon ambition's poison, dies thereon and here we have uh, again from the plot details of nemesis comes back again and to her the three furies bringing in scales and to them there's three devils appear as well and then enter to them three ghosts everything's in threes and the furies first fetch in sebastian carry him out again which done they fetch in stukely and carry him out again and then they bring in the moor and carry him out again by this time is the moor to Tangier come, a city longing to the Portugal. And now doth Spain promise with holy face as favouring the honour of the cause, his aid of arms and levies men apace. But nothing less than King Sebastian's good he means. Yet at Succa de Tiepa he met some say, or Tupea, he met some say in person with Portugal and treateth of a marriage with the king. But where's ambitious wiles and poisoned eyes, there was nor aid of arms nor marriage, for on his way without those Spaniards, King Sebastian went. And we're going straight into the first scene of Act 3. Enter the King of Portugal with his lords. There's a senate sounding, including Stukely and someone else. Uh, Louis de Silva, ambassadors of Legate Spain, and they all enter at different doors, and there is also brought on a chair of state. Honourable lords, ambassadors of Spain, the many favours by our meetings done from our beloved and renowned brother, Philip, the Catholic King of Spain, say therefore, good, my lord ambassador, say how your mighty master-minded is to propagate the fame of Portugal. 
to propagate the fame of Portugal and plant religious truth in Africa, Philip, the Catholic King of Spain, for love and honor of Sebastian's name, promise him aid of arms and swears by us to do your majesty all the good he can with men, munition, and supply of war, a Spaniard's proud in King Sebastian's aid to spend their blood in honor of their Christ. And Father, to manifest unto your majesty how much the Catholic King of Pain affects this war with Moors and men of little faith. The honor of your everlasting praise, behold, to honor and enlarge thy name, he maketh offer of his daughter Isabel to link in marriage with the brave Sebastian, and to enrich Sebastian's noble wife, his majesty with promise to resign the titles of the islands of Moluccas, that by his royalty in India he commands. These favors with unfeigned love and zeal voweth King Philip to King Sebastian. And God so deal with King Sebastian's soul as justly he intends to fight for Christ. Nobles of Spain, sith our renowned brother, Philip the King of honour and of zeal, by you the chosen orators of Spain, the offer of the holds he makes are not so precious in our account, as is the peerless dame whom we adore, his daughter, in whose loyalty consists the life and honour of Sebastian. As for the aid of arms he promiseth, we will expect and thankfully receive at Cadiz as we sail alongst the coast. Sebastian, clap thy hands for joy, honoured by this meeting and this match. Go, lords, and follow to the famous war your king, and be his fortune such in all as he intends to manage arms in right. All right, and uh, exit uh, the uh, King Sebastian leaving Stukely and someone else who might be the Duke of Avero, uh, but uh, I'm leaving it open as to who it is. Sit fast, Sebastian, and in this work, God and good men labor for Portugal. For Spain, dis disguising with a double face, flatters thy youth and forwardness, good king. Philip, whom some call the Catholic King, I fear me much. Thy faith will not be firm, and disagree with thy profession. What then shall of those men of war come at those numbers that do multiply in Spain? Spain hath a vent for them and their supplies. The Spaniard, ready to embark himself, here gathers to a head, but all too sure Flanders, I fear, shall fill the force of Spain. Let Portugal fare as he may or can. Spain means to spend no powder on the moors. If kings do dally with holy oaths, the heavens will right the wrongs that they sustain. Philip, if these forgeries be in thee, assure thee, king, to alight on thee at last. And when proud Spain hopes soundly to prevail, the time may come that thou and thine shall fail. And they exit. Um, so we've got um, more, more ambassadages, uh, more, more uh, manoeuvrings. Um, are we feeling more secure? Nope. Silence again reigns. <laughs> it's complex, isn't it? I mean, it's a, it's hmm. global history. You know, it, it, you can't sort of do Aristotle with this stuff. You know, it, it has to be multi-layered. And in, in, in that sense, it's it's interesting, I think. You know, you've just got to kind of respond to it in a, in a different way if you want to see this as a picture of the way that the world works. I think well, it's interesting because we were somewhat spoiled maybe by Selimus because that had, a, to me anyway, a lot of human interest. Whereas I feel that perhaps this is more of a historical record, uh, historical record, as we might say, uh, instead of um, a kind of drama, which is very interesting um, in the fact that it makes it very uninteresting <laughs> to me. I, I think that's the thing is that this is a very theatrical thing. It's, 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 it's happening there. It's not drawing us in primarily on character interest in that sense there is character there is stuff to mine um but it's not doing the interior life very much of many of these things there's there's, there's a lot going on and therefore this forum does not suit this text very well i think is a fair way of putting it mm. um dan so you all know how i felt about Solomon's last week that i thought it was <sighs> just i think it reads well as a text and plays horribly on on, on stage I feel the opposite with this one. Um, 
especially going back to the dumb show at the beginning of this, as you've seen, Rob, the, the dumb show is very well um, explained in the plot there. They even have vials of blood and sheep um, gather, like explain <laughs> that. But I feel like that in the first act, I mean, the, the presenter at the beginning, as well as here, um, is really guiding the audience along in ways that we cannot see. So I take your point that um, this may not be the form at least to see, to be able to understand the plot, um, the story as well as we could if we were actually seeing what would, what could be or what would be staged here. Right. Well, the other problem is we have a very partisan presenter as well. I mean, there's something very interesting going on, I think, about who's reliable, you know, which, which the, the reliability of, of these events and, and motivations and things. I think there's, there's a whole lot um, that I find, find quite interesting that we sadly do not have time to dig into uh, on a deeper level here. We can only do the surface. Uh, so we're going to rattle on into the final uh, sections for today. Act 3, Scene 2. Enter Abdul Malik Muli Mahamet Seth. Seth. Uh, Zario, uh, Zario and their train. For Portugal, led with deceiving hope, hath raised his power and received our foe with honourable welcomes and regard, and left his country bounds and hither bends in hope to help Mohammed to a crown, and chase us hence and plant this negro moor that clads himself in coat of hammered steel and heave us from the honour we possess. But, for I have myself a soldier been, I have, in pity to the Portugal, sent secret messengers to counsel him. As for the aid of Spain, whereof they hoped, we have dispatched our letters to their prince, to crave that in a quarrel so unjust, he that entitled is the Catholic king, would not assist a careless Christian prince, and, as by letters we are let to know, our offer of the seven holes we made he thankfully receives, with all conditions, differing in mind as far from all his words and promises to King Sebastian as we would wish, or you, my lords, desire. What resteth then but Abdel Malek may beat back this proud invading Portugal and chastise this ambitious Negro Moor with thousand deaths for thousand damned deeds. Forward, Zareo, and ye manly Moors. Sebastian, in see in time unto thyself if thou and thine misled do thrive amiss. Guiltless is Abdel Malek of thy blood. Moving straight into scene three of Act Three, uh, we have the entering of Don de Menenzi's governor of Tangier with his company speaking to the captains. Captains, we have received letters from the king that with such signs and arguments of love, we entertain the king of Barbary that marcheth toward Tangier with his men. The poor remainders of those that fled from Fess when Abdel Melek got the glorious day and stalled himself in his imperial throne. Lord Governor, we are in readiness to welcome and receive this hapless king, chased from his land by angry Amarath, and if the right rest in this lusty moor, bearing a princely heart unvanquishable, a noble resolution then it is in brave Sebastian, our Christian king, to aid this moor with his victorious arms, thereby to propagate religious truth and plant his springing praise in Africa. But when arrives this brave Sebastian to knit his forces with this manly moor, that both in one and one in both may join in this attempt of noble consequence, our men of Tangier long to see their king. His princely face, like that of summer's sun, glads all these hither parts of Barbary. Captains, he cometh hitherward amain, top and top gallant, all in brave array. The sixth and twentieth day of June he left the Bay of Lisbon, and with all his fleet at Cardiz happily, he arrived in Spain the eighth of July, tarrying for the aid that Philip, King of Spain, had promised, and 15 days he there remained aboard, expecting when this Spanish force would come, nor stepped ashore. 
as he were going still. But Spain, that meant and minded nothing less, pretends a sudden fear and care to keep his own from Amaras fierce invasion and to excuse his promise to our king for which he storms as great Achilles erst, lying for want of wind in Aulis Gulf, and hoisteth up his sails and anchors ways. And hitherward he comes, and looks to meet this manly moor whose case he undertakes. Therefore go we to welcome and receive, with cannon shot, and shouts of young, and old this fleet of Portugal's and troop of moors. And they exit, and we rattle straight into the next scene, and trumpets sound. <laughs> Chambers are discharged, bang, bang, and then enter at one door the Portugal army with drum and colours, uh, and uh, King of Portugal and the Moor, all their train, etc. Muli Muhammad, King of Barbary, well met, and welcome to our town of Tangier after this sudden shock and hapless war. Welcome, brave queen of Moors, repose thee here, thou and thy noble son, and soldiers all, repose you here in King Sebastian's town. Thus far in honour of thy name and aid, Lord Muhammad, we have adventured to win for thee a kingdom, for ourselves fame and performance of those promises that in thy faith and royalty thou hast sworn to Sebastian, King of Portugal and thrive it so with thee as thou dost mean, and mean thou so as thou dost wish to thrive. And if our Christ, for whom in chief we fight, hereby to enlarge the bounds of Christendom, favour this war, and, as I do not doubt, send victory to light upon my crest, brave Moor, I will advance thy kingly son, and with a diadem of pearl and gold, adorn thy temples and enrich thy head. Oh, brave Sebastian, noble Portugal, renowned and honored ever mayest thou be, triumpher over those that menace me. The hellish prince, grim Pluto, with his mace, dings down my soul to hell, and with this soul, this son of mine, the honor of my house. But I perform religiously to thee that I have holily erst undertaken, and that thy lords and captains may perceive my mind in this single and pure to be, as pure as is the water of the brook, my dearest son, to thee I do engage. Receive him, Lord, in hostage of my vow, for even my mind presageth to myself that in some slavish sort I shall behold him dragged along this running river shore, a spectacle to daunt the pride of those that climb aloft by force and not by right. Nor can it otherwise befall the man that keeps his seat and scepter all in fear, that wears his crown and eye of all the world, reputed theft and not inheritance. What title then hath Abdel Melech here to bar our father or his progeny? Right royal prince hereof you make no doubt, agreeing with your wholesome Christian laws. Help then, courageous lord, with hand and sword, to clear his way whose lets are lawless men, and for this deed ye all shall be renowned, renowned and chronicled in books of fame. In books of fame and characters of brass, of brass, nay, beaten gold. Fight then for fame, and find the Arabian Muli Hamet here, adventurous, bold, and full of rich reward. You're muted. Brave boy, how plain this princely mind in thee argues the height and honour of thy birth. And well have I observed thy forwardness, which being tended by your majesty, no doubt the quarrel opened by the mouth of this young prince, and partially to us may animate and hearten all the host to fight against the devil for Lord Muhammad. True, Stukely, and so freshly to my mind had this young prince reduced his father's wrong, that in good time I hope this honour's fire, kindled already with regard of right, bursts into open flames and calls for wars, 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 to plant the true succeeding prince. Lord Muhammad, I take thy noble son, a pledge of honour, and shall use him so. Lord Lodovic, and my good lord of Avero, see this young prince conveyed safe to Mesagon, and there accompanied as him fitteth best. And to this war prepare ye more and less, this rightful war that Christians God will bless. 
And at this point, after three acts, you get a sense that the momentum has reached some sense of direction, that all the forces are now pretty much gathered together. They're all heading for war. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think that before we go into final thoughts, we are into extra time now. Um, just to, to go into this, that sense of momentum building of all these very disparate forces, and they are very disparate, um, coming together in common cause or complete lack of common cause or just because it seems like a good idea at the time, um, are moving towards the battle and everything it's called the battle and we are heading towards the battle and it's all about the anticipation of the battle. Um, and the, with all this othering language that we have throughout this play uh, is, is a question of you know, that th there is deliberate intent in that, that all, each side and each faction is finding ways of attacking their enemy in, in unpleasant ways before they even meet them on the field. And I'm wondering if that's, that's deliberate or whether I'm just, uh, just uh, looking for uh, things there and whether there's a modern way of looking at that and changing things or, or, or addressing it uh, beyond obviously uh, a very very disparate cast in terms of how you might put this together today. Uh, this is very much a play that I think where our imaginations are required in greater force than just the text we are reading. We do need to think about um, this as something that we are watching, that we are staging rather than one that we are reading because yes, we are a little bit lost um, at times, or we have been, um, but it is our job to try and present or think about how we might present with clarity these things. Um, so, uh, sort of final lap of the room then, final thoughts. Anyone want to jump in first with uh, the play so far? First, three-fifths down. I'll start picking on someone if no one, no one comes out. Ah, Alex, stepping in. This is uh, going to sound very puerile, but I, I have to pick a pop cultural reference for what all these plays remind me of. And this reminds me most of that first Star Wars prequel, um, which was a garbage film in many ways, um, but did actually have a core of something it was building towards. It was very visual. So if you read the script, it would have made no sense. It started in a lot of disparate places that even if you knew the first three films, you would have been totally lost. People talk about, you're talking about federations and trade deals and uh, double crossing people. People, an offstage big bad that you never ever saw because the emperor wasn't there, the sort of Amorat thing. Um, but sort of actually did have some reasonably good characters in it. I mean, I, I, it's much more a, a, a film and the, like I think this is a play of those sort of um, block powers and things. Actually the characters in it, the events going on around them are so enormous, they almost overshadow the characters having a personal life. I mean, I think the nearest this comes is Sebastian who at least gets some lengthy speeches dealing with various things and who actually sort of reminds me of the, the sort of Ewan McGregor character in that god awful film. Um, sort of, it seems to be wanting to do the right thing, but actually comes across as a bit foolish um, and a bit inexperienced. Um, so it, it's, I, I've warmed to it. I hated it for the <laughs> first act, um, but it's, it's, I, I've warmed to it and I could sort of see potential in it. And like you say, it is building towards the battle. I mean, the battle is the money shot and it sort of feels like it's taken a while gearing up to, to get there. So, um, so you, you've yeah. put the case that this is a t uh, the Battle of Alcazar, <laughs> the Phantom Menace. Yes, <laughs> that means the next that, that means the next two acts are Attack of the Clones, and that's not a good direction oh, to be heading. That's I'm even sorry. worse. I mean, it's also full of horrible racist stereotypes like that. It so is. <laughs> um, that's that's one of the big, big <laughs> questions to go with, Dan. <laughs> So oh, I really enjoy all sorts of comparisons to Star Wars films. I would love for this to be a, a nice, neat comparison to Phantom Menace, even with the racist stereotype there. We've got, um, although we don't really have a Jar Jar Binks character in here. Um, oh, but that being said, I feel like this is a much, that was trade negotiations, Phantom Menace. I don't see any of that kind of thing <laughs> going on over here. Um, I do feel like, um, this is much more of a, this is a much richer play than Phantom Menace script ever could be, and wish to be. I, I, I think to be fair, he's not actually making the comparison. I've, I've, yeah, I've, but, yeah, but I think the comparison of that this looks, this, there, it could have been a good move, maybe it could have been a good film. I don't think that could have actually been a good film. Um, this play, I do feel like really does, um, what, once again, I'll just say benefit from how we would stage it. Um, 
there. I did have another point to add to that. Um, luckily, because of the plot, we, we could see exactly how everybody was cast in this and who, how everyone was doubled. Um, um, Which sadly I've not followed, but never mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll come back to you, Dan. I'll come back to you, Dan. Stephen. Yeah. Uh, well, it was just to go up to sort of Alex's point. I think it's a really great point in the sense that this terrible Star Wars film is kind of in hop to the fans, isn't it? It, it is stuck with this incredibly complicated story that is just going to annoy everybody if they, if they mess around with it too much. And, you know, the, the placeholder for that here is, is geopolitics because it's, you know, very, very recent events. You are stuck with these recent events and you've got to just try and try and make the best of them and try and evolve something out of it. So I, I think that's that's just a really helpful way of putting it from Alex there about, you know, sometimes you're just stuck with politics and you, you can't mess around with it. And this is what you end up with. You can't change history, damn it. Um, especially when it's quite recent history. Uh, Robert Greene. Hmm? Unless, unless you're Robert Greene. Unless you're Robert Greene. This is Peel. It's very different. Uh, Tamara, you, you were waving your hand. I was wearing my hat because um, it, um, besides the idea of um, bringing in Phantom Menace to compare this, I think um, science fiction scripts are actually a good way of looking at this simply because I tried to keep track of names and relations and I gave up halfway through. And, um, and I think much like in Star Trek, when you have the techno babble, um you know there there's um i don't i don't mean that this has techno babble but but the names and everything that's going on is going to be much more clearer when it's on stage and when you've had time to workshop this with all the actors when you have a visual as well that's um the reason why i personally have warmed up and started to love history plays in general because you start to, to um, when you actually see them, they make sense. When you try and read them, you get lost because you get confused by all the honorifics and all the, the, the place names that people are named after. And the fact that they then inherit different place names so that with different place names becomes a different per but, and et cetera. Uh, yeah, so it's gonna... like, wait, this was that, this was that. So, so I think it's helpful in the sense of, you know, with the weird names, like they might as well be Klingons. Well, the, there, there, is a, there is an interesting dialogue we could have about uh, the way uh, alien names were created with science fiction um, and certain uh, 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 cultural uh, problems uh, with uh, certain, a lot of science fiction in the 50s uh, onwards um, and the way they were structured, which is actually quite a good parallel with this. We don't have time now. Um, Simon, any final thoughts from you? Uh, I well, I, I I won't launch into a passionate defence of the Phantom Menace, which uh, I feel yeah, let, let's is, move on. Uh, let's move on. Has been much maligned, uh, <laughs> despite the Nemoidians. Um So no, I, uh, I I don't feel that um, I don't have a pressing need to read on with this play. I'm not left at that point. Um, perhaps unlike you guys who are maybe warming to it, I feel uh, if something doesn't kind of get me early on, I I. I it's my own fault, but I tend to drift. So I don't have a pressing sense because I probably because I'm aware of what what I think what Stephen was saying about it being pretty much written for this politically motivated uh, reason, which kind of it just it just deflates my will to uh, to want to read on because I kind of know why it's been written. Pamela, uh, final thoughts from you. It kind of follows on from Simon, but I find there hasn't been very much tension, or you know, like I'm not excited to i i want some battles i want some actual fighting <laughs> and i want something to happen because they're all Phantom stunning. menace has a very good battle Sh so shush okay. shush now <laughs> i was gonna shush say now. if we don't get a big lightsaber fight now i'm gonna be disappointed yeah uh, okay i can't promise lightsabers but there's definitely gonna be some spectacle coming up soon i kind of feel fact. like we've needed a bit of that because i'm just yeah i hmm. yeah okay oh, God. <laughs> yeah um <laughs> Well, to some degree, we have had spectacle. We just haven't seen it. That's sort of I the problem. You know, the we've problem. had furies. Yeah. We've got all sorts of things going on. Yeah. Um, we just yeah, can't see I'm it. Which I'm sure would be incredible, but yeah. We've, we've had mention of a comet earlier. So, you know, the, the, there's all such, so many possibilities to come later on. Aliki, final thoughts? Uh, you've muted yourself by accident in, rather than unmuting yourself. Okay. There I go. <laughs> uh, 
I don't really have much to add. Um, I, I'm, I continue to be intrigued by the idea that this is a proxy war between uh, Istanbul and the European powers uh, at some level, but that's not very interesting as a play. Uh, I'm just gonna say, I went more Game of Thrones than Phantom Menace. It seems like there's a whole season's worth of plot in the first two acts and then first three acts. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, Alan, final thoughts? I'm just finding it very difficult to engage with. I would agree with Simon. It's There's some damn good speeches in there, but there's no coherence to it. Uh, okay. Um, Helen, uh, final thought? Um, I, there was a great booing opportunity for <laughs> King Philip's treachery. <laughs> um, and, uh, and a mention of the Flanders Wars. I, I had a quick look. This is about four or five years before Lepanto. Mm. So, I mean, things are really building up here. There's, there, is a, there is a tremendous amount at stake in geopolitical terms. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I, I mean, I try and look at it as it would have been looked at more on its first night rather than how we would do it ourselves. Mm. There's, there's, it there's a huge amount has, of context we don't have. Yeah, yes, it's the, it, has, it has points of interest. Mm. It's not the greatest play ever written though, I don't think. Damned with faint praise. Uh, v v Victoria, have I come to you for a final thought? <laughs> um, yeah, I think probably I've not really anything to say that's not been said already. It's, there's a lot of facts in it and a lot of kind of the politics and the wars and the things they have to get across and just i'm not really warming to any of the people there's nothing particularly personal or likable or I, I just i just don't care about them really okay so to close session i'll go back to dan um because i'm sure he'll have a much more positivist view um because i always like to try and end on a positive note dan your final final thoughts um just that i don't think that there's I'd be interested rather than trying to change the races to make it, um, I guess, less offensive to today. I'd be much more interested to see it with all of that there because I feel like that's highly relevant mm. at this point, um, to see all of that. And I feel that this really does do well with good characterizations of the actors. I agree that it doesn't mine into the, the, the intense or the emotions or um, as much as some of the other plays that, um, but I feel that's, performance brings that out um, okay. and so I do feel like especially like I said against once again with the dumb shows I do feel that will add that does add a lot more elements to it um, that we're just not seeing Yes, I think the, the 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 othering that's going on with the language and the racism is, you know, these these are these are characters who are being racist and for a purpose, and that they are they have a an angle, and that uh, that 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 seems to be part of what the text is is playing with, and um, that that's a really good point to close on. Uh, we have two more acts to go on this, which we'll be starting uh, tomorrow. We'll also then be segueing into a completely different play from a completely different period in history, but a similarly a history history play uh, as we go into lock rain so uh thank you to all my readers today for helping with uh exploring and getting a, a first sense of the battle of alcazar but the alcazar's battle is yet to come goodbye bye bye, -bye.